My name is John Hinkle and uh, I live in the Bay Area and I was first interested in WikiLeaks when I saw the collateral murder video as many people have said the same thing. It was quite the introduction to um, to what I already knew my government was doing. And yet it was the first time I was able to see it from the eyes of um, from the eyes of the soldier and and the striking thing was it wasn't really a war they were in it seems it seemed like they were playing a video game and and to for me to see that my father having been in the Vietnam War when I was a young child I could see that there was something so untrue that war had become a machine, a game, or something like that, and it was such so striking. I knew that that our presence in the Middle East was totally immoral, for it was obviously based on a lie. I already knew that because I try to be aware of what's really going on behind the scenes of what my government does in the world, and I'm convinced that this is a this is a dying empire, one that is really. Um, is desperate to try to hold on to the old forms that that have allowed it to rise to this kind of um, this this kind of murderous reign. And really, what I see in the WikiLeaks releases and and in what Bradley Manning tried to get out to the people, what I see is nothing short of. Uh, a totally, as Julian Assange has, has put it, illegitimate governance. There is nothing legitimate about the U.S. government. And as Chomsky has said over and over again, the U.S. is the largest terrorist state that has been in existence for a long time. And, uh, and the Orwellian reality that that our government points to other people as being terrorists when we've never really truly been attacked. Oh, some people could say 9-11 was an attack on US citizens and I would say yes. But by whom? Who are the real terrorists? That's my question. And certainly for me I, I can answer that. It's my own government and I'm responsible as an American for that. And, uh, and I feel as though I owe a lot to the world because of, you could say, I suppose, the karma of being an American at this time. We seem to be getting a somewhat expanded definition of what terrorism is these days. Senator Ludlam, in an interview, sort of defined what terrorism isn't. <laughs> you know, like... Uh, throwing the sticky liquid in front of a whaling ship or occupying a street because you're disgusted with corporate greed or mm -hmm. um, taking and getting access to some files, you know, because you want to reveal injustice. All of that's not terrorism. But maybe you'd like to comment on what you as an American believe terrorism is. Yes, I well, I agree wholeheartedly with with those very important definitions of what it isn't, because that's often the kinds of things that are being corralled into that term. And uh, the way we use language and the way we, as human beings, abuse language are, is, key, um, is key to how we abuse each other and ourselves as a society. Uh, without the language to obfuscate or to change the meaning of something, into its opposite. We wouldn't be able to live the lies that we are living these days in this, uh, th uh, this warfare mentality. And the word terrorist is a prime example of this. It's what it is, I think, is the use of violence, whether it be a violent, threat, a violent action against people who primarily have no investment whatsoever 
in a violent, um, in, in violence as a, as a valid way of communicating. Innocent people. And the stereotype that has been um, embellished and turned into a, um, a call for um, extravagant uh, push of, of military might throughout the world by the United States. This use of the word terrorism has expanded itself to be utterly ridiculous. Um, calling Julian Assange a terrorist when there is not one ounce of evidence to show that he or any of the actions of WikiLeaks or any of the leaks that they've done um, or released from any source, not just not just the, the war logs and, and, and collateral murder. None of them have led, as far as anyone can tell, to violence. And isn't that the ir irony, is they revealed all kinds of acts of violence against innocent people in many different countries. And who are the real terrorists in that situation? That is really the question. And that's the question that isn't asked in mainstream media. It you, isn't asked. You quoted Chomsky before. Yes, and Chomsky has said it for years that the United States is a terrorist organization. It is the most brutal one, I would say. I don't know if he said that. But certainly, talking about blood on the hands of innocent lives since the 60s, and even before. But the 60s, when my father was in the Vietnam War, I come to find out after that that the war was based on lies. A huge lie. And this has been a pattern for the United States for a long time now. Over and over again, it's become modus operandi, M-O, to either create a false flag attack or just lie about one, like the Gulf of Tonkin, or lie about what other people are doing, like Saddam Hussein, and then proceed to basically kill hundreds of thousands of people for no reason. That's terrorism, because that's a way of making everyone else around the world be so afraid they don't want to ever question, again, the authority of that kind of power. And that's what it's all about. It's about fear. And that's what terror is. But it's very directed, a directed fear. So I would say, that that is what this empire is based on, is terrorism. So just on the subject of fear, um, the NDAA seems to inspire a lot of fear in people. It seems designed to inspire fear too. Mm -hmm. um, but not just among Americans. It could be fear from anybody anywhere in the world. How did you guys react when that law came in? That legal framework was found, should I say? When the legal framework of the NDAA was passed on New Year's Eve by Obama, who I could tell had every intention and from his actions were, was clearly in support of it from the beginning. Um, when that happened, on a certain level, it was just one final nail in the coffin of the U.S. Constitution, of the U.S. grand experiment. Of the, of the American ideals that in years gone by have really rightfully in some ways and sometimes been held up to the, to the whole world as being an, an ideal. And as Julian Assange has, has often said that the, the Bill of Rights in the United States in some ways still stands as a model and uh, he supports it wholeheartedly. And the rule of law as being an instrument for justice for the common people, which is really a, a, an intrinsic part of the framers of the Constitution, uh, an intrinsic element that was a foundation for anything that was, everything that was important about that document. That has now been laid waste, really. The Posse Comitatus Act, when I first heard about that, when I was young, I said, wow, that's an important bill. Somehow instinctively I knew how important that was. And to me it was like one of, the, one of those 
one of those uh, pieces of legislation that could stand the test of time for so long because it is just a no-brainer that the military should never turn against its own people. Even in an act of rebellion, perhaps then you have a war-like situation like the Civil War, and perhaps maybe things are different then, but a police action? No. It says no police action. Well, arrest of anyone, detention of anyone within the United States by other Americans, well, that's a police action. And yet now, it can be done legally at any time to anyone who's um, determined to be um, a threat to the state. And the military would put you away, put someone away for that indefinitely with, without any of the protections of the Constitution. Well, that basically eliminates everything about the Constitution because if you have the right to free speech and you speak out and then you're put away because you're deemed a threat without even a chance of a pretrial hearing, well, it, it appears that this is the framework to destroy the Constitution. And certainly one can see that this has been building for a long time, that this is not something that is exactly new, but this is the first time it's been codified. Whether it will ever be challenged by the Supreme Court and whether that's even a moot point at this point is, is an open question. But I do see the writing on the wall. This is an act of, that can only be taken by a very desperate and fearful group of people in power. And to me, that's the only hopeful side I can come, that comes from it, is that, oh, they're on their last legs. They wouldn't do this if they weren't desperate. And so that's the one sense that I have in looking around at the real, the, the almost total destruction that's upcoming, that I see coming to our economy because of this total deregulation and corporatization of our government and, uh, and they're actually the world, the world economy being just handed over to a bunch of addicts who are addicted to money. I have to say that in a way, it, it perhaps could be a relief for us to get on the other side of that and begin to build something that is really truly human. Because corporate government has proven itself to be one of the least human uh, structures we've created as human beings. And uh, yes, it's not perhaps at least yet as overtly destructive as fascism in its old form. For example, the, the Nazi regime or, or Stalin uh, or Mussolini, Pol Pot, the more egregious one man at the top take over and destroy whole societies and lives for the sake of power. Now it's a little different now. This corporate takeover of our democracy is so much more insidious because it's not one human being you can point to. It's an idea. It's something more. It's a force, that a structure that seems to use human beings, even the ones at the top, even the greedy ones at the top, just being used to... Um, extract lifeblood in the same way our society has for hundreds of years. Certainly European societies has it through colonization and U.S. slavery. And uh, certainly there's a legacy there. But corporatism is something new. And I believe that Anonymous and WikiLeaks and the new digital... Um, Uh, the digital play, um, how would you say that? Communities? Yeah, the digital communities, right. That go beyond the borders, that are fast fading in relevance. The nation state is so far, already far gone in relevance. The corporations have made it so. They are stateless, have no allegiance to any people, society, other than to the degree they can manipulate 
them and, and, uh, and use them and convince them to be chattel consumers, um, tools, part of the hierarchy that maintains that structure. Um, but there is something new here, and I believe that that's the reason why Anonymous, which is an idea too. They say Anonymous is an idea and it cannot be killed. And it's not just an organization, and it's anti-hierarchy. And, and what has been amazing to me about Anonymous is that, and their allegiance to to the force of um, conviction that li lies behind the activities of WikiLeaks uh, is that when they say we are legion, they're talking about something that goes much beyond our old fashioned ways of thinking about uh, a legion of soldiers going off to war and, and staying staying with the, uh, with the fight for, for the good of the whole, for the good of one's nation. But there's a whole different element in this, we are legion, I, I see. It's a, to me, it means we are legion with what is most intrinsically human in us. Because if we are not, we don't have much future against the legion, if you could call it that, of the corporate state. That's the devil legion. <laughs> yeah, in a, in a sense. I mean, if one wants to go, go that route, uh -huh. the movie The Matrix really basically laid that out so amazingly. I mean, what are the squiddies in the, in the Matrix? They're the drones. And, and what is the, uh, the, the illusion that has been woven uh, with all these people asleep and being their, their forces sucked dry? Well, the illusion that keeps them occupied in the negative sense of the word, is a, a digital fabric of um, illusion of who they are. And wage their identities. slavery as well, perhaps? And what? Wage slavery? Wage slavery, yeah, it's another way uh, of looking at it. Yes, because they're hooked up, their lifeblood is, is pulled out of them, and they're made to focus on what amounts to this fantasy world as being the meaning, meaning for their lives. And when, when they wake up to that, it's like, well, that's not who I am. It's an identity thing. It's a wake-up call. Wait a minute, who am I? And, uh, and that's why what Nozomi had written about to mean so much, I think, in terms of recognizing that it's a question of identity. Who are we as human beings? Are we going to be determined by this, what is... Uh, shown to us to be um, really a caricature of our humanity. It's just, it's like a cartoon. Um, to, to, to go to work and, uh, and to be caught in a web of debt and caught on a wheel like a rat, always trying to just make the grade and follow along with this, this hierarchical um, sense of, Oh, I, I don't want to end up being like, like, um, like those unfortunate ones who are uh, in some other country and working at some slave shop um, because, because we've out, outsourced all, a lot of our manufacturing jobs. But, oh, aren't we helping everyone else? That's the corporate line. Aren't we helping everyone by doing this? When everyone actually in the long run is suffering, mm -hmm. except for those at the top. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Occupy movement is really all about. It's an awakening from the matrix and saying, uh, wait a minute, this not only is not working for us, but I have more in common, perhaps, with one of those workers in the slave shops, in the, um, in the sweatshops, than I do with the rich guy down the street in that mansion. And that recognition that they don't care about us is, is it's, it's a visceral reaction to basically fraud, be, be the biggest fraud that's been perpetrated on humanity in history, I think, is, ha is unfolding right before our eyes. And yet this fraud is really an extension of the same militarism that extends from that colonial frame of mind that we've inherited, that white privilege that is, 
is uh, has always insidiously been um, uh, an undercurrent throughout American society from the early days. Yes, the Constitution, a beautiful, amazing document. I believe now, though, it's time for a new Constitution because I don't think the United States Empire is something that can sustain our humanity. And it's already betrayed our values so deeply that I actually feel as though I'm a world citizen. My allegiance, my legion is with all the people of the world who recognize their brother as being a valuable, a valuable gift to humanity and not somebody to mow down for oil.